to commas. Commas is all things tech. You see culture and technology coming together. Life hacks. The practicality right now in the inefficiency of the internet of buying and selling stuff is extraordinary. Entrepreneurship advice. I think the first thing is you got to understand your business inside out. Love and tech. I've almost reduced dating to kind of this very momentary snap of a person. It's going to be a fire show. I have yet to see something these days that's truly differentiated. New advice and new inspiration every show. It really is about the next generation of creators going faster, further than we did. And now, Sequoia Blodgett. Now let's start stacking them commas. On this episode, entrepreneur Esoza Equidara explains how she was forced to shift gears when confronted with competition from a major tech company. And yours truly will discuss the entrepreneurial mindset. Entrepreneurship advice. <laughs> Learn from the hottest and most successful investors, founders, and innovators in the game. Determine your greatness. It's time to get your knowledge up. Okay, okay, for sure, for sure. I think a lot of people don't realize when it comes to entrepreneurship, it is all about mindset. And it looks sexy, right? Like when you look in the media, everybody's like, I'm an entrepreneur. You see it on all these TV shows. Shark Tank was the catalyst to start that movement, right? And I feel like when you actually get into the grit of it, it's like, oh, snap. I didn't realize I had to actually build a business, right? And I think that that's really interesting because... People don't understand the dynamic of what it actually takes to build a business. Building a business is hard, you guys. It is not something that happens overnight. It is not something that you dream one second and two months later, as you guys are seeing in some of these publications in the media, you're seeing all of these great exits and you're seeing these raises and people look like they're doing fabulous and it looked like it looks like it literally happened within a couple of months, right? But that's really not the case. You're actually seeing their highlight reel and you're actually seeing the end result of all of their hard work. So they've been sitting in the trenches and really trying to build up the business over a good extended amount of time and you're seeing the end result of that. So you got to understand when you go in as an entrepreneur, it is not about the glitz and the glam and being on the cover of Black Enterprise or Forbes or Fortune or whatever it is, right? It's about actually building a business and sustaining a business. And that takes wherewithal, that takes tenacity, that takes hustle, that takes grit, that takes determination, that takes patience. That takes all of these things that we don't see. So there is a mindset that you have to go into entrepreneurship with. And that mindset is understanding very clearly that this is a marathon and it is not a sprint. Nipsey Hussle said it best. The marathon continues. And that is no joke. When it comes to entrepreneurship, it takes time. You've got to build out this company. You've got to make sure that you've got products market fit, meaning you have to make sure that whatever you put out to the market that the customers are purchasing. If that's on a granular scale, you've got to be brokering these deals. And not only that, if you're going to stay on as a CEO of your company, you've got to be putting the proper people in place to run this company successfully. Because at the end of the day, if those people are in place, your company company is going to fail. I kid you not. So even though it looks mad sexy to be on the red carpet with entrepreneur under your title saying I'm the founder of XYZ business, that's not the game, you guys. The game is actually doing the work. It's making sure you put in the proper people in place to make sure that your company is sustainable and that it's actually growing to the magnitude that it's grow- it needs to grow to. It's making sure that you have somebody who's doing customer service and that your clients and your customers are satisfied and taken care of. It's making sure sure that you've put sales in place. It's making sure you put marketing in place. You've got to build a business. There is nothing worse than saying you're an entrepreneur and not doing the work. So just make sure when you decide to jump feet first in entrepreneurship that you are so prepared to give people what they need. At the end of the day, entrepreneurship is not about you. Hey, yo, it's Papa. We've got Isosa Igadara on the line. How are you doing? I am 
so good. So I'm good. so excited to talk to you because you have so many gems. We're going to get into all of that. Black Women Talk Tech. Of course, you have your own company. But before we do that, tell the listeners a little bit about your background. Uh, so I started out actually in banking. Uh, so I, I worked as a, a banker in a city group. So I, I did sales and um, corporate management and leadership. And then I did uh, marketing execution. So I was at city group for about seven years before I randomly bumped into my future co-founder on the subway. For which business? Uh, for Cosign. Nice. So you mm-hmm. were at Citigroup. You found your co-founder. Did you even know that you should be finding a co-founder? I mean, I feel like when I moved to Silicon Valley, I was like a co-founder. What's this thing? <laughs> oh, no, not at all. I was totally in the banking life and just having a good time. Then I realized I was like, I don't want to be pigeonholed and be in banking all my life. So I was like, let's see what's cracking in technology. And so I was going to conferences and stuff randomly. And then this person just like walks up to me and compliments me on my outfit literally um he starts talking and he's in technology i was like oh gosh i would love to be in technology i want to learn from you and so we literally continued talking and then we uh literally built a business six months later so yeah just meet people on the subway and start businesses with strangers that is the moral (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you guys started Cosign. Where did the idea for the business come from? So at the time, you know, this was back back in the day, you know. Um, at the time, it was like everyone, it, like apps were still sort of new. And um, everyone was like looking at, um, there, there was an app for that kind of phrase kept coming up where there was like Temple Run, all these gaming apps and all these things that where people were like just embedding really cool things on your phone because you're spending so much time on it. And um, at the time also Instagram was um, somewhat new, but we realized that most people were looking um, for inspiration and discovering new products through different social media content sites. And but we realized also within that experience, it was really hard for you to realize what that red shoes are or that black top or that pink dress. Anything that's in the um, photo, you couldn't really have access to or gain the right information for you to assess if you can even afford or buy it. So that really, um, really drummed up the idea for being able to see now and buy now within that content and medium. Since that was like really taking everyone's attention at the time. And so that's how we came up with a concept for Cosign, which is to um, make products, uh, uh, recommend products through images and make them shoppable for your audiences as an influencer or just a uh, person who has a lot of great recommendations. You can start to make money every time an item is sold. And so that was kind of the genesis for it. We wanted everyone to be able to make money on their own and allow, you know, um, you to have that freedom to decide um, how you want to uh, take up your content to the next level. So this is a really interesting perspective because ultimately Instagram ended up coming out with this as a feature set. So yeah. what did that, what did that do to your business? So the funny part is, like, as soon as we decided um, literally to pivot into a, a different business because our, um, uh, we'll get into I, maybe the genesis of like trying to build a B2C business in general and how much money you need and how crazy that experience was. We realized our customers, which are the brands, started asking us for um, more targeted solutions around matching them up with actual influencers to do campaigns, right? Because that, no matter what we try to do with them in terms of partnership, all they wanted to do was so we connect with your influencers and do actual campaigns with them and so um, and, and reach their target audiences through um, interesting collaboration. So we decided to evolve our business um, into Nexstar, which is essentially influencer marketing at scale for brands and retailers who are looking to collaborate and reach their target audiences in a unique way with high-quality content. So mm-hmm. I love how you talked about the actual expenses of having a B2C business because what a lot of people don't realize is when you're competing against a platform or when you're 
featuring your business on a platform like an Instagram and they come out with a feature set that basically trumps your business, you've got to be willing to make that pivot happen, but also understanding that they have the financial resources to roll out the business the proper way. So talk a little bit about how expensive it was to actually build the first iteration of your business. Oh my gosh. It was so expensive because for us, we were building something that didn't really exist yet. And they didn't have um, a line of sight to how to make that work on someone else's platform. Cause that's the whole thing. That's the big thing where, where you're, ha- you're trying to make changes, not on your own platform. It's, it's not like Instagram just making changes on their own where they have complete and full control. You're actually making um, changes and creations on someone else's domain and their territory to start some limitations. But then the whole idea of just being able to have enough money to survive <laughs> and build that and, and really market that solution to your target audiences and with us, we had two main stakeholders, we were the influencers and the brands. It was so painstaking in the uh, B2C world, um, especially when, um, you know, raising funding dollars were, was a really big issue. And even at that, you know, we, we were kind of one of the lucky ones being able to raise uh, $1.2 million over the course of how many years, but it still was so piecemeal, right? And so it was really, really um, difficult. Um, and the writing was on the wall. And I think in the beginning, I was really scared to actually change the business. And I, I think part of it was I made this promise, right, to my investors and everyone around me that this is what we're going for and this is what we want to go go after. And and it was um, um, mostly that. And I, I just really tried to make sure that we try to build that business. But um, I think you know, this is a very simple thing you hear it all the time, like, listen to your customers. Like, <laughs> they, they're not saying, if, if it's not crazy strong, the push um, it was very strong in the beginning, but as time goes on, you know, if you're, if it's not, like, picking off the way you want to, or, you know, it's just a little too hard to build out in that way, be, don't be afraid to, like, actually change um, course a bit and find, find a sweet niche or a spot that allows you to really grow your business in a significant way where, where you're really creating um, product that um, people love and, and want to pay you for. And so when I, when, when we finally decided to do the, the B, B2B business, it was so uh, like transformational for me. I mean, I mean, I'm still going through it right now. So this is a work in progress, <laughs> but like, I couldn't believe that, I was get like people were paying me for a service. It was just like unbelievable because we were doing so much for free on the B2C side because it's the app world. So everything's free and you only get paid. We only got paid on the commission, which means we had to do hundreds of thousands in sales or, or if we did like B2B partnerships and that was like few and far between or a licensing. It was like all these different very variations of a business model which you had to kind of um, figure out just to survive. Really, we did a lot. But here, it was just so, uh, it, you feel the difference when you um, listen to your customers, figure out a way to support them with a solution that they really care about, and you just, they pay you every month. Like, the SaaS model is amazing. You're like, <laughs> yes. Like, what is happening here? What? Money? <laughs> <laughs> Consistently? Oh recurring revenue? <laughs> My God. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Like, um, it was just, it was, it's, it's a great feeling. I love that. Tell me how you got past that fear. Because like you said, you felt like you would be judged by your investors. What got you past that fear? You know what? I'm like, everybody's fine. They sleep, they wake up, and they're not nervous at all. <laughs> right? Like, And I feel like um, part of that made me feel like, okay, I'm struggling so hard as an entrepreneur with all this like up and down emotion and figuring out how to, you know, make a business work. And I really fell in love with the idea and product, you know, um, more so than like what a customer really needs at that moment. And sometimes it's interesting because sometimes you can have a business that really um, would be great if it, if it, if you just had enough money or if you just had enough 
marketing dollars or just had enough developers or whatever, the best hire, um, or you're doing somewhat well and you're getting some money in, but it's it's not enough to like make it seem like it's wildfire, right? And when you're in that situation, you're kind of um, constantly questioning how to like get to that next level, how to level up. And so when I, you know, realized consistently for literally 18 months, every time we talk to any of our business partners, no matter what industry or retailer, I mean, or brand, no matter what industry we went to, there was just one question they always asked. And it was it boiled down to getting to the reach because at the end of the day, they need eyeballs. Mm-hmm. They want to get as many consum- uh, uh, consumers as possible that are possibly interested in their product. Right, and the the great thing about that is that it's relevant traffic, which is so hard to get these days online. And so, it was a really nice and interesting um, balance. And I I I had a a good sense of the players, right, because I've been in it for so long. Um, Have relationships with influencers, have relationships with the brands. So this is a unique uh, space where, you know, why have I been saying no for the last two years? two years on that right? <laughs> um, thinking it's a distraction when this is probably the path we should have um, gone a while ago. And so I'm, I really, I had to really talk myself um, off the ledge and really just have a real introspective look and say like, you know, it's going to be okay if you make a change, right? Like businesses are meant to evolve and you're only as good as uh, or valuable as um, what you are to that consumer willing to pay for it, right? And so I think um, once I was I formed the courage to like tell my partner, like, can we change this out? <laughs> can we evolve? And really did the research and said, hey, this is like really, really going to be a, a big thing for us. We we realized that this was a shift we needed to make and told the investors, and they were like, oh, this is great. <laughs> I was like, what? And I got all this, like, emotionally. I mean, granted, we had a handful that were like, no, go for the goal, beat Instagram. I was like, bruh, <laughs> I was like, unless you're going to give me unlimited money, <laughs> like they got, um, I can't get to that level. But I think it's important to know where you are and um, build your own path. I love that you talked about that. And I think one of the bigger things to note, too, is – you saw this vision. You had this co-founder. You're you and your co-founder are actually in a relationship. You're a married couple, right? And so you guys yeah. are going through this process together. Did that disruption of the company ever disrupt your actual relationship going through that process? Um, no, I think because we technically, you know, always were like in it together, we, we saw, we saw the shift together, right? I don't, I don't think we got there at the same time, but I think within relationships, you start to know your partner very well. And then when approach the conversation and say, Hey, you know, we, we think that the writing's on the wall. And if they, if they don't think, if they don't see the writing, right. Um, you, you kind of have to like make sure they get there with you and say, okay, let's, Let's come to an agreement around when when will be the time where we decide we've given it all we can, right? Mm. And, and and consider other options. And and that's when you start to have real frank conversation like real talk with your <clears throat> partner and significant other about what the next steps were. And I think the best thing that could have happened to us is that we built a business first together and know how to work with each other already. Mm. So in layering in that relationship um, side of it, you know, you, you, you know, know when to separate it outside of business, which is really hard because if you're two people who really like business, it's like come become becomes of you. Right. And you're just always talking about it, but you really have to kind of make that point. But we never, um, I think we, we just always um, had a sense that, no matter what we had each other, we always have, we were supporting each other in our dreams through this livelihood of a business to support other people. And so I think um, it never got in the way, luckily. And so, so far, I was going to say knock on wood, but there's no wood around me, so I'm going to say <laughs> knock on my couch. And um, just the 
really um, thoughtful about a, approach and then how you're 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 considering things in general. So we we didn't really have that um, too much of a uh, of of a business effect in our relationship because we, we kind of separated. And it, and uh, anytime we it, it like kind of got close, we we always communicate like to overly communicate, and that's what kind of helps support um, anything that we're doing. I love that. I love that you also talked about time. So do you feel like, two questions, how long do you feel like you took and you, people should give in terms of time before they make that pivot if it's not working? And do you feel like, you know, you said you had to wait for him to catch up. So do you feel like you guys waited too long to make that pivot? You know what? It's all, it's all you know, I like, I'm a Christian. So I said, it's all in God's hand. And so for me, I think, you know, timing is an interesting thing because, like, everybody gets somewhere before you or and you have to catch up. And so I, I felt, for me, it's important if you're, if you're working on a business and you're um, tracking the results and you, you are considering, um, like, hey, what's working, what's not, and, and you're just, like, fearless, like, you change and you change again until you find something that's like crazy traction. Like, and I, I didn't, I, I don't think I really understood how much of a shift product market market fit was until um, being a part of Black Women Talk Tech and building that um, kind of community. It, it, it was just like, oh, this is what people are talking about. Where it's like <laughs> so explosive. And so when I understood that piece that kind of helped me also kind of shift my business and say hey this is what I should be feeling once you know a product is out there and it's really um, supporting a, a underserved need right and so you're, that's what you're looking for you're looking for that product market fit where it's it's like super obvious that this is an um, a problem for someone it's not being served and they literally either have no solution for it or the solutions that are out there are not fulfilling what they need. And so if you can find that at any mercy, like literally keep changing until you find it. <laughs> it I, I, I wish um, I was able to kind of have that foresight, but I, I, I wish I wasn't ready for it. Like that's my past. Like I, I wasn't, I wasn't in the mindset to be able to um, make that shift in that, in that moment. But, now I am going full speed ahead now that I know what I know, right? And so I, I would just take it one step at a time. Nice. So you talked about your company that you had to make the pivot for. Now let's talk about Black Women Talk Tech because that was like a very linear, straightforward path from what it looked like from the outsider looking in. So what was that setup like for you guys where you knew, okay, this is a thing? Oh my gosh, like from the date, like it's so crazy because it wasn't supposed to be a thing. Like, <laughs> was, like, like every time I think about it, I I marvel. I was like, it's it's um, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving because I'm it's like so blessed to see that growth there. And it's like, wow, so that's a business that's really serving an uncanny need. Um, and so you know, we started out really, I met, I read, like, again, I have this thing about meeting strangers and starting businesses with them. I love or it. Organizations, like, I guess it just works for me. Because I literally met Regina when on the line, and she knew Lauren. And we, we randomly um, got selected for this, like, conference where you had to, like, apply to get in and all this other stuff for information. And um, we were, like, you know, only three to four uh, black women in the room of 60 women. And so we're, you know, started, you know, connecting and, and chatting and literally and said, Hey, do you know any other black women tech founders? And, and I was like, uh, no, I probably read like maybe about, about maybe two, <laughs> but I don't know. I, I know a handful is if, if that. And it's like, okay, so let's like figure out how we can do like a meetup or create a like a curriculum where we would want to learn something from, like, and just sit, figure out how we can support each other. Literally, that was it. The, the the lead time was, like, three weeks to the event, <laughs> and we're like, okay, we'll do it at um, Google, get a classroom, let's see if we can fill up 15, 10 people in the 30-spot room. 
put it out there two weeks before um, the event, and then we get over 300 people trying to come in. And I, when I say my whole my whole mouth was on the floor, I was like, "What is happening?" I didn't even know there were that many black women in tech, like in technology, period, <laughs> building, like you know, what I mean, building businesses. It was beyond i was like whoa uh, so we had some like because we didn't obviously have a face to voice any spots and we had well over 300 um people we said okay let's do an application process and get whoever the the, the best of us can have the opportunity to come and mentor and network and it was like international on day one too because people flew from canada from <laughs> california everywhere just for uh, two weeks like, we put it out there. I didn't need no more, literally an email blast. Wow. It was not heavy at all. So that's how I knew the we were like, okay, something's here. And then they kept asking us, when's the next one? I was like, what, what next one? Like, this was, <laughs> this was just, we were supposed to just meet up, you know, talk, support. And, and it was just, it really grew crazy after that, like the next year. We were like, okay, let's expect for 300 um, people to come to the conference. Okay, we were good for that. And then we got over 500 people show up. And then we're like, okay, all right, we got to really, we got it figured out. We're going to try, like, see if we can make sure we have, like, 800 because, you know, we're, like, we're, we're thinking, you know, uh, 800 to 1,000 people maybe might show up. I mean, we got 1,300 just a few months ago, and it just, Every year we surprise ourselves and I literally, I don't even, <laughs> it's like, it's been a, a such a amazing journey. Um, just seeing how much, um, how many black women kill in the game. Like when I, when I say I've learned so much from just seeing my peers, like just killing it. And then just this overall community growing in that way in general, it's just, it was just amazing just to see. Um, and the impact we've been able to make in, in terms of, like, women getting actual funding as a result of the conference, money we've given away in pitch competitions, 100 and now 20000 or something or another dollars. And it just, it, it's be, it's beyond. <laughs> it's like, learned so much. What are some of those key learnings that you kind of gathered from putting on this conference? Had you, first of all, let's talk about, had you put on conferences before or was this a new thing? Oh. No, when I say I'm still learning, I this is new, new. Like I, I, I've <laughs> we've done three conferences, but I feel like I, I'm still on the first day. It's, it's, I have such a big respect, like big respect for these women who are producers or event planners and holding it together. Because I was like, I don't understand how 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 you do this. Like this is <laughs> no joke. I mean, especially at different levels. I mean. We went from thirty to thirteen hundred. Like that is yeah. way, way faster than most conferences ever go, really. And um just understanding crowd control, noise noise uh cancellation and just you know, everything is just no, I didn't have to answer your question, no, I didn't have not a lick of experience. And mind you, we still run our separate businesses, right? So this was something we did on the side to support our community, to support ourselves. When I say it's it's, it's definitely unsustainable, <laughs> and sometimes I'm just like, whoa. Um, but I think the 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 best thing about it is that um, you learn so much from people and each other. So one thing, um, so the biggest thing, of course, I've learned is um, what product market fit truly is <laughs> when it comes to meeting an unserved um, market of women wanting to connect uh, and and connect in this way and self-identify. And and I, I also think um, understanding timing as a part of of business development and um, traction because I, I I've been to organizations in the past or events in the past that try to do this or were pretty similar in nature. Um, but it just didn't catch in that way. And I think the timing wasn't like incredible now in terms of the climate and, and what, what, what kind of also helped to support the growth of, um, 
the community connecting in this way as well. So I, I thought that was in, in, incredible and, and keen. The one thing is, too, what I thought was like, hey, you know, what we virtually did is like, hey, we're not seeing, you know, um, enough black women, <laughs> uh, technology founders and having certain experiences and challenges. And I want to talk to them. And then now you just created an ecosystem or an, uh, an event to bring them all to you. So it made me think about in my business, what can I do to bring who I want around me on my businesses to me, right? And so it helped me kind of, you know, think about that um, realistically for for us. And so now I'm in the middle of like considering like doing events um, centered around influencers or brand managers to to be around and, and be in the, the center of what I'm doing and 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 what the pain points they they have. And so that's been really helpful and transferable in that moment. And then it's great to have to be around a bunch of um, really excellent women who are either um, pre-series A or pre-seed or seed um, building their businesses. Some of them have millions of dollars in revenue. Some of them literally just $10 in revenue. Some of them no revenue at all. Like it, and it's just like a great, balance of understanding um, how some have raised, how some have chosen to do uh, bootstrap and what their process and thinking is, right? Or even thinking about hiring or finding the right talent. It's just been great to have that community. Well, you are certainly doing a marvelous job with both companies. Where can we find out more information about Black Women Talk Tech, the pivot to your new company? Tell us where we find you. Okay, so Black Women Talk Tech is on social media. Um, we have our website, blackwomentalktech.com, um, and we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're everywhere. So just Google us, or we'll, you'll find us. Um, so my previous business, Cosign, is still there. You can definitely download the app and recommend products to your um, followers and on social media. But the other piece, too, is you can... Connect with us also on nextstar.ai. That's our newest company. If you're an influencer or a brand manager, I'm happy to help and serve you. All right. So first things first, when you're building a business, it's super important that you think about the community that you're building around that business. Because I think a lot of the times people want to start something that they're excited about. They go put this product out to the market. And then once it's to the market, they don't hear anybody purchasing or see anybody purchasing. And ultimately, it's crickets, right? And so the best businesses and the best brands that I've seen become super successful, including commas, is they focused on community first. And what does that mean exactly? So when it comes to community, you want to think about who's your tribe, who correlates to your business, who relates, who are you attracting? And I'm not only talking about social media because of course that is a community right and you're starting to build up this community via social media so maybe you're attracting a certain type of person then you can kind of see if that type of person is a good fit for who you would ultimately want to purchase your products or services right but start to add value to the market first especially if you're in the info product space that's super important that you're adding value to the market first because Because once you start to add value to the market, then you're going to quickly understand what your customers want. And you're going to see that happen through the community that you're building. So, for example, when commas initially started, we went out and we talked to a bunch of people and we were like, hey, when you're building a business, what are your needs in particular? And they were like, we need X, we need Y, we need Z. And so instead of servicing them right off the bat and actually providing them with what those needs were, were. So instead of building a product or service and saying, hey, here, this is exactly what you asked for, we built a community first, right? So we utilized media and we created podcasts and we created video content and we basically 
brought them all into one center place. So you can build a community via Facebook groups. You can bring them to Instagram. You can bring them into a live event. For us, we brought them to Facebook groups, right? And we started to nurture them and actually supply them with a lot of content. So I would bring special guests on throughout the Facebook group and then have them talking to the Commas Club via Facebook, right? And by way of doing that, I was able to then start to build that trust. There's that no like, and trust factor when you're actually building a business. So I was starting to build that no like, and trust factor, right? And they started to trust anything that I put out, not necessarily anything, but they started to gravitate toward the things that I put out. And they were able to put out stuff and they were able to chime in and they were able to make sure that they had some type of input, right? And then eventually I started to charge the community. Then we pivoted into a course and then we took another pivot and made it into a membership platform. So there were some tiers before we actually got to where we needed to go. But I think the biggest thing with that is really understanding the type of value and then controlling the community because, and I don't mean controlling in a controlling way, like, oh my God, like I'm overseeing this, but like controlling what happens within the community and being very forthcoming in terms of what your objective is for that community is one of the biggest points. And what I mean by that is when you put a bunch of people together who are obviously have different backgrounds and you guys have a common thread of building a business or whatever your community is, maybe they have a common thread that they like cars or whatever it is, right? When you put a bunch of people together, you're going to get a lot of different perspectives and you're going to get a lot of people who want to self-promote, right? And that doesn't serve anybody. So if somebody's coming into the community and they're like, hey, buy my XYZ, it doesn't necessarily make for a great community. And having been at Facebook, I visited Facebook last year, and understanding the dynamic of the types of communities that they're building with these groups It's not even a part of their mission statement for you to be like hitting people over the head constantly with like things that they should be purchasing. Right. And that isn't something that we were doing either. But people weren't understanding that in the beginning. So you have to be in control of your community and you can't be afraid to completely just block people. Right. If things aren't the way that you see fit, because everybody has their objective and you're the community leader. So people are following suit from what you let happen and what you allow with that community. So if you obviously have this group of people and people are doing their own thing, then they're going to continue to do that because you didn't set any boundaries or you didn't establish what the ground rules were. And so you need to do that up front so people know very specifically what those goals are, right? And so I think about that going back to commas in the beginning where we obviously curated this group of people, entrepreneurs, and as an entrepreneur, by the sheer state of your mind, you're creating products and you want to put them out to market. Well, a lot of entrepreneurs understand, like, I want to be a creative and I want to innovate and all those things, but they don't understand sales and marketing. And so they're like, hey, here's my thing. Listen to it. Here's my thing. Purchase it. Here's my thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, without engaging, without adding value to the community, without doing the necessary work in order to be a contributing member, right? Right. And so that's one of the things I would say that you definitely have to guard in when you're building this community, whether it be on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever and social, if it's actually a community that you have in person, just making sure that you set up those ground rules and you're very, very clear about what you want for the community. Right. And so ultimately, the end goal is to be able to monetize that community. So once you're establish these ground rules once you've been able to give them all of the content, the value that you think necessary, that they've actually built a relationship with you, that they've been willing to purchase, then it's okay to then monetize that community. But don't do it right off the bat unless that's a part of your business model. So I've seen the other side of that coin too, where you're actually paying to be in the community. And so you establish a membership and the customer, the client pays to be a part of that community. Now that's a whole different story. So it depends on what your business model is and the direction that you're going within your business. But if that's the case, then you're not actually opening that community up to the public. You're having somebody pay and then enrolling them in that community. And they're going to know the ground rules going into it because they're going to know before they even paid you to be a part of that community, right? And so those are some major keys that I would pay attention to 
when it actually comes to biz- building that business and being able to a monetize your community or monetize your community ahead of time is making sure that one that you're very very clear in terms of what your end goal is so if it's to build that community establish a no like and trust factor and then monetize them or is it to actually monetize them in the beginning and then sell it as a product or service meaning the community is a part of that membership so if that's the direction you're going then you have to establish the no like and trust factor beforehand that means you're on webinars maybe you're doing some ig live some facebook's maybe you're running ads so people start to see the brand they understand the brand they know the brand right and that means you're going to be spending money up front versus on the back end so you're hoping that monetizing the community will get you a return on your investment which is your ads or your social media or what have you but that's just a different so so you're going to pay either way you're going to pay if you're going to monetize the community you're going to pay prior and if you're not going to monetize the community if you're going to wait then you're going to pay in terms of like time so you're essentially spending time building up this community and then eventually monetizing the community and then getting paid from the community so that's just two different ways that i've seen it work very very well great examples of that is blavity before they were actually a strong media company they had these micro communities so creatives and they gave them all this value women and then they gave them all this value then they launched these bigger platforms and they already had this baked in community to go ahead and launch them too on the flip side you've seen that with other course platforms like a course from scratch or like a booze platform marketing accelerator where you buy first and then you get access to the community so just think about that when you're going out to build your business if you are a service based business this is the plug you know who's the plug it's time Time to get caught up on the hottest in tech. Keep it locked, you heard? With Sequoia Blodgett. I see you, little mama. Commas is a community of like-minded startup entrepreneurs with the goal of being profitable. We focus on helping founders gain an understanding of how to build an online, digital, or tech-enabled business through courses, coaching, and support. So what does that mean? Well, we have a program for new entrepreneurs with no or minimal prior business experience looking to go from zero to a growing startup. That includes courses in entrepreneurship mindset, product development, branding, marketing, publicity, fundraising, and business formation. Pretty much everything you need to get your company off the ground. In addition to that, we have a new program for established entrepreneurs looking to scale their startups with automated sales funnels and paid advertising. We also help them focus on hiring and managing a team. If you're interested, log on to commasclub.com for more information. Until next week, it's your girl Sequoia, and I'm out.